Hello and welcome to the AP World History Podcast. This is episode 13, The Nomad's Moment in World History. People started growing their own food and raising domesticated animals around 11,500 years ago. And we know that the transition from hunting and gathering to farming was one of the biggest turning points in human history. But it's also important to know that not all areas on Earth are suitable for farming. So there are places all, all over the Earth, uh, deserts, the subarctic, uh, the steppe, dry grasslands, uh, that just can't support agriculture. And throughout human history, not a lot of people have been able to survive in these uh, inhospitable areas. But around the year 4000 BCE, the world starts to see a new way of life emerging that sort of blends together aspects of hunting and gathering with aspects of a settled agricultural lifestyle. So this way of life focused not on growing plants, but instead entirely on raising large amounts of domesticated animals. So in order to raise large amounts of animals, people that lived this way were constantly on the move because they needed to find new pastures, new places for their grass-eating animals to feed themselves. We call these people pastoral nomads. They were different from traditional hunter-gatherers because they traveled with their animals and their survival depended on the products of their animals. So their diet consisted heavily of milk, of meat, of animal blood, and their clothes were made from animal hides and furs. This way of life caught on all over Eurasia, uh, in the Eurasian steppe, sub-Saharan Africa, the Arabian and Saharan deserts, uh, the subarctic regions of modern-day Russia, and the high plateau of Tibet. Before pastoral nomadism, uh, these were typically inhospitable areas. So this happened all over Eurasia, but not really in America. So if you remember from Guns, Germs, and Steel, America didn't have the big domestic animals that Eurasia did. So some of the things that these pastoral societies had in common. Uh, typically, these societies supported smaller populations than farming societies uh, because pastoral societies need more land. They had animals to feed and animals need to eat grass. When you have lots of animals, you need to eat lots of grass. So you needed to be mobile. So like earlier hunter-gatherers, these people didn't simply wander around looking for food. They had extremely good knowledge of their environment and they followed changes in vegetation and water supply. So the basic principle was uh, that you wanted to turn grass, which humans can't eat, into food and energy through the use of animals. So. Populations were smaller, people typically lived in tribes that were based on extended family, uh, and these tribes weren't as equal as earlier hunter-gatherer societies, uh, but they also weren't as unequal as big farming civilizations. So there were fewer specialist workers uh, than in the big established farming communities. Women in pastoral societies had more rights and higher status than women in farming societies. Uh, they had fewer restrictions on them, they could participate in public life, they could work, uh, they were primarily responsible for raising children, uh, they typically took care of small animals such as sheep and goats. Widowers could remarry without being looked down upon, women could typically initiate divorce, uh, but at the same time women were not totally equal with men, uh, tribal leadership was still dominated by men and uh, women didn't own uh, their possessions. Uh, and you also see in the video uh, about the Mongols that wife stealing was a common practice with Mongol tribes. Uh, but all things considered, women did enjoy higher status. And this was something that was looked down upon by the quote unquote educated elite from the bigger farming communities who thought these people were just uncivilized barbarians. Uh, throughout history, farming societies and pastoral societies were in constant contact with each other and they hated each other. The pastoral way of life wasn't entirely self-sufficient. Pastoralists had a hard time living only off of the products of their animals, and they often sought access to the grain, the agricultural uh, items, uh, manufactured items, luxury goods uh, that were available in more established civilizations. Nomadic pastoralists typically lived in small tribes based on extended family and these tribes were fiercely independent of each other, they usually didn't trust each other very much. Uh, but with that said, it was common for uh, loose alliances to be formed from time to time uh, between the tribes. 
So when these alliances did form, it was usually either to protect themselves from attack by a larger civilization, or in some cases to attack larger civilizations. Building alliances among tribes typically required uh, somebody who's very charismatic, somebody that a lot of people could like, could get behind. And, and once these alliances were established, the leaders would often try to convince their people that the groups that they had allied themselves with were actually blood relatives all along, and they were really one big extended happy family. Um, so we call this concept fictive kinship, trying to convince people that they are actually part of one family because that's how the tribes were structured. The first of these big nomadic empires were the Xiongnu, uh, and they came into power in the Mongolian steppes uh, north of China. Their founder was Modu Chanyu, and he ruled from uh, 210 to 174 BCE. And he was a charismatic leader who was able to uh, build alliances and, and unite feuding tribes in Mongolia, so similar to what uh, Genghis Khan would do much later on. Uh, so we know to the south of uh, Mongolia lies China, and a couple of weeks ago we looked at some important Chinese concepts, including the idea of the Middle Kingdom and the idea of tribute payments. The Xiongnu's empire propped itself up uh, from funding uh, from China in the form of reverse tribute payments. So the civilizations living on the periphery of the Chinese empire were expected to come to the Chinese court, kowtow, or bow to the Chinese emperor, and bring tribute payments, bring, uh, bring gifts to the emperor. Uh, but what happened in reality uh, when nomadic empires became strong and a threat to China is that the role of giving tribute payments would actually be reversed. So the nomadic empires would still come to the Chinese court and, and make a show of it for everybody. So it looked to the Chinese people that they, uh, these nomads were actually bringing tribute or bringing presents. But in reality, the Chinese would have to buy these nomads off to ensure they wouldn't attack China. So the Xiongnu basically extorted money from China. China, give us money or we will attack you. Uh, the Han Emperor, Wen, was eventually forced into declaring that the Xiongnu and the Han, the Han uh, were equals. Uh, so this was a really hard pill for Han Chinese to swallow. Uh, they lived in an advanced civilization and they viewed uh, the Xiongnu and uh, other nomadic pastoralists as being nothing more than illiterate barbarians. So the Xiongnu were eventually weakened uh, because of internal feuding. Uh, they were defeated by Chinese military forces, and the tribes in Mongolia uh, fell back into a state of uh, political disunity. Um, but the way they organized their empire, uh, the way they built alliances and extorted money from a more advanced civilization, uh, would pave the way for future nomadic empires. Okay, so the Xiongnu were the first but it wasn't until the post-classical period that the nomadic empires really made a mark on world history. During the post-classical period, it was nomadic people, um, such as the Arabs, the Turks, uh, and the Mongols, who would create the world's biggest empires. So we looked at the Arabs when we looked at the rise of Islam. Uh, but the Arabs are similar to the Mongols in the sense that they were a nomadic group that developed an extremely powerful empire. When we looked at the rise of Islam, we looked at pre-Islamic Arabia and the tribal structure of the Bedouin. Uh, between the years 500 and 100 BCE, the nomadic Arabs developed a camel saddle that allowed them to fight from their camels. So the Mongols had horses, the Arabs had camels. Mastery of the, uh, both of these animals gave both the Arabs and the Mongols military power. Uh, the Bedouin Arabs used their mastery of camels uh, to control the trade routes that ran through Arabia. Uh, and when Islam emerged and Islam spread, it was uh, these Bedouin uh, on their camels who became the military force that initially drove uh, the expansion of Islam. So although intellectually Islam developed in urban areas uh, such as Mecca at first, uh, then Damascus, uh, later Baghdad, the spread of Islam wouldn't have been possible without uh, the nomadic tribes that lived in the Arabian desert and uh, their mastery of camel warfare. So while the Arabs were pushing on the more established Eurasian civilizations from the south, Turkic-speaking people were closing in from the north. 
And Turkic people were nomads. Uh, they weren't one unified people. When we talk about Turkic people, these are people who speak Turkic languages. The Turkic homeland isn't Turkey. Uh, they actually originated in Mongolia and uh, southern Siberia. So between the years around uh, 500 to uh, the late 900s, Turkic-speaking people uh, developed a handful of empires, nomadic empires. Uh, and they, these were always uh, loose affiliations uh, of tribes, so similar to uh, the Xiongnu. Um, the leaders of these alliances or empires were known as the Kagans. Uh, so for hundreds of years, Turkic empires would base themselves in the steppes of, of Central Asia and would interact with the larger civilizations to the south, uh, whether it be Byzantium or Persia or China. Uh, at times they would raid these civilizations, uh, at times they would trade with these civilizations, uh, at times they would ally with these civilizations, um, and sometimes they would just extort money from these civilizations in the form of uh, tribute payments. Around the beginning of the 10th century, uh, Turkic nomads started converting to Islam, uh, and this process was complete by the 14th century. So. By the 14th century, Turkic people were predominantly Muslim. Turkic people would then become the third group uh, of people to spread Islam around the world. So the Arabs were the first, uh, the Persians were the second, and the Turkic people were the third. In the 11th and 12th century, uh, Turkic rulers stopped referring to themselves as Kagan, which was their traditional term, and began to call themselves sultans, uh, which was the Muslim term for ruler. So not only did Turks become Muslim, but they carried Islam to new places. They invaded northern India and formed the Delhi Sultanate. Uh, and this, the significance of this is it, it rooted Islam in India. Uh, later, they would sack Constantinople, uh, the capital of Byzantium, uh, and create the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and by the year 1500, the Ottoman Empire had become one of the, the major powers in, in Eurasia. So we'll look at the Ottoman Empire uh, in, in detail uh, in the next unit. Um, so Constantinople, the capital of Byzantium, became Istanbul. So through their interactions with Eurasian civilizations, uh, the Turkic people changed uh, dramatically. Um, for one thing, they changed from pastoral nomads to sedentary farmers. Um, for another thing, they changed from uh, polytheists, worshippers of many gods, uh, to followers of Islam. Uh, finally, they, ch they changed from people who lived on the margins of big civilizations and, you know, in turn extorted wealth from these uh, uh, civilizations to creators of their own uh, large civilizations.